Hey, welcome to Believing Thinkers. Today, we are going to be looking at non-formal arguments. You may be wondering, what is what is a non-formal argument? What do you mean by that? Well, by non-formal argument, I mean arguments that do not have their premises or conclusion explicitly stated. Now, you might be wondering, well, how can we identify such arguments? Don't worry, I'm going to give you some help. And we're going to go through some practice examples as well. So that by the time we're done, you don't just know what these arguments are, but you can actually identify them on your own. This is very important because, let's face it, I won't always be around to help. I'm also going to teach you some pitfalls to avoid. So be sure to stick around for the entire duration of the video. This, guys, this isn't one you can just watch the first few minutes of. I want to help you so that you can become a better thinker, make well-reasoned arguments, and above all else, love God with all your mind. Hey, by the way, be sure to hit that like button and the subscribe button so that you can be kept up to date when our next video posts because there's a whole bunch in this series. Are you ready? Then let's get started. When we listen to others speak or read a social media post, blog article, book, or maybe we're reading an academic paper, we often expect there to be some relation between the statements or sentences being made. These relationships will have a structure. Not all these structures are an argument. So before we look at what I refer to as a non-formal argument, let's first look at the different structures that are not arguments. For our first several examples, I will be using Dr. Braxton Hunter's Chronicles of the Adonai, the first volume, The Colony. All right. So, here's our first example. Without wasting time to explain, I launch down the hillside, onto the horse, and across the river. Before I finish processing what is happening, I am passing the spot in the tree line where the figure stood only moments ago. Now, is this an argument? No. No, it's not. For you literary scholars, this is an easy one. Here, Dr. Hunter is describing a sequence of events. This is known as a narrative. All right, that was too easy, right? Let me give you another one. Suddenly, I am no longer in the saddle, but on the edge of a cliff, staring down. About 30 feet beneath, there is a frozen pool of water that is fed by a stream from the river. Oh, that's an argument about nature. <laughs> Again. <laughs> No argument. No argument here at all. This is a descriptive passage. A descriptive passage states a series of facts about something. Because this series of facts can be organized in different ways, sometimes it is conceivable to see how one might mistake these for a sort of argument. But it wasn't. All right, we got another one. And now this one. I don't know where you came from or why I've never seen either of you. But outside of the colony, there is nothing. Outside of the colony, everything has been taken by the great darkness. Again, this one, like the other two, is from Dr. Hunter's book. Ding, ding, ding! We have a winner! <laughs> what do you think? This one is tricky. You might think, like Grandpa, we finally have a winner. But here we have something that's a little trickier, an explanation. You see, explanations seek to explain why something is true while arguments, on the other hand, seek to prove that something is true. So, if we look again at the key part, notice the speaker is explaining that the reason why there is nothing outside the colony is because it was taken by the great darkness. So, we don't have an argument here either. And again, explanations are important to learn. So then, what distinguishes an argument from the other examples? Well. It is that the argument seeks to not only support the conclusion logically, but to also demonstrate its truthfulness. It should be noted that the person presenting the argument not only makes a claim of truthfulness, but also provides reasons for accepting the claim. Now, fortunately for us, most arguments have certain telltale words used which can help us to identify that the series of statements we are looking at is in fact an argument. And these terms also can help us to identify the premises and the conclusion. Now, this is helpful because once we have done this, we can begin to evaluate the argument itself 
to see if it actually proves its claim, also known as the conclusion. Now, here's a list of some of those premises indicator words. Let's go ahead and pause the screen if you need to, write them down. And here is a list of conclusion indicator words. It is worth mentioning that just because we see an indicator word does not mean that there is a premise or a conclusion. Take the indicator so, used in the sentence, I am so tired. So does not indicate the conclusion is the word tired. Rather, so here means very. So it is best to try and identify the conclusion by finding out what the speaker is trying to prove rather than by mere vocabulary. So let's look at a few examples to see if we can find the premises and conclusion. Now, most of these will be in the form of a conversation which is typically where we will find informal arguments. Example one, Mary, I wish you would stop smoking Richard. Richard replies, why, because it smells bad? Mary, no, because everybody knows smoking causes cancer. So you should quit. Now, do we have an argument? Richard is not making one. How do we know this? Because he's asking a question, and as we learned in the previous video, Questions are not arguments. But what about Mary? Let's look at Mary's final statement. No, because everybody knows smoking causes cancer. So, you should quit. Now first, let's see if there is a conclusion. I always like to find this first since there's only one in an argument and because for me it's typically easier to find. Remember, the conclusion is what the individual is trying to prove. Do we have a conclusion indicator word? Well, if you looked at your list, yes, the word so. Now that we have the conclusion indicator, we know that the conclusion is likely to follow, which is, you should quit smoking. And the premise, because everybody knows smoking causes cancer. Do we have a premise indicator? Yes, it is because. Now, it should be mentioned there is an ad populum fallacy here. That we'll deal with that and how to deal with arguments that have fallacies in them in another video. At this point, I should mention that there are some implicit or suppressed premises here. In other words, premises that are not directly stated. Um, what would they be? Well, the most obvious is one, that you don't want to get cancer. And perhaps in addition, another premise is something like, because cancer will likely kill you. Premises tend to be implicit when it's obvious to the presenter of the argument. In other words, they think the premise is self-evident, so they have a tendency to forget to mention them. Now, you might be thinking, what happens when these indicator words are not present? Well, let's look at another example. You are tired and you need to rest. Your body does not function at peak performance when you're tired, and you have a test tomorrow. Unfortunately, in this argument, there are no indicator words. Let's start by trying to first figure out what the argument is trying to prove. See if you can figure it out. If you need to, go ahead and pause the video. All right, this argument is trying to prove that you need to rest. The remaining statements, also known as propositions, are added to support why it is you need to rest. We might state them uh, like this. Premise one, you are tired. Premise two, your body does not function at peak performance when you're tired. Now a sort of implied premise here would be you need to function at peak performance for your test tomorrow. Granted, part of that was stated. And the conclusion, therefore you need to rest. It is worth mentioning, conclusions are often stated first in a conversational context. Not always, but often. So we want to keep this in mind when we are hunting them down in this sort of conversational type argument. One more from Dr. Hunter's book. Pay attention to the part that I'm going to put on the screen here for you. Everything else is sort of setting that up. Everything 
that goes on in the world goes on the way it does because of something before it. Something before it caused it to go on just that way. If there were no God, then even my decisions would be just the result of those little dominoes falling in line. Okay, now pay attention. I think I have freedom, don't you? Well, yes, I say. Well, if we really have genuine freedom, then there has to be a God who gave us a special gift to rise above the same old cause and effect, to rise above those dominoes and make a real choice. Okay, what is the conclusion? What is the speaker here trying to prove? Here, I'm going to summarize the conclusion. There has to be a God who gave us genuine freedom. Here we could also substitute the phrase genuine freedom for free will. And what are the premises? Well, premises one, if we really have genuine freedom, then there has to be a God who gave us genuine freedom. Premise two, we really have genuine freedom. Conclusion, therefore, there has to be a God who gave us genuine freedom or free will. Again, you can I'm using those two phrases interchangeably for now. Whenever you're taking somebody's statements and evaluating them as an argument, be sure to repeat back to the person what you understand them to be saying. Never under any circumstances, attempt to represent their statements formally in a formal argument, premise one, premise two, conclusion, without giving them a chance to evaluate if you understand them correctly. Because they have not made the statement in a, in a formal argument, they may not have thought about it being represented logically. And when you repeat it back, it could be that you've misunderstood them. It could be that in repeating it back, they hear or understand there to be an error in their reasoning, and it gives them a chance to fix that. Never under any circumstances do this and then proceed to point out the fallacies in their thinking without them first having a chance to do that for themselves. That's just bad form, all right? All right, hopefully this has been helpful. Some things to remember. Explanations seek to explain why something is true, while arguments, on the other hand, seek to prove that something is true. Number two, arguments seek to not only support the conclusion logically, but to also demonstrate its truthfulness. Number three, try to find the conclusions first, as there is only one in an argument. If need be, try to insert, therefore, if the statement still makes sense after that, chances are it is the conclusion that you're looking at. Number four, it is not unusual in a conversational setting for the conclusion to be stated first in the argument. Number five, please consider partnering with us by supporting our ministry financially. All donations we re receive currently go to paying for ministry needs and are a big help. What's that, Grandpa? You sneaky little rascal! <laughs> you snuck that in! <laughs> okay, well, we love you all, and until next time, Take care and God bless. <laughs> Has anybody seen my titties? I, I think I lost them. Oh.